first the motor. Electric motors are rather baffling devices, but they all depend basically on the ability of electricity to magnetise things. If I uh, wrap a bit of wire round a nail... Oops. Oh, dear. I've got it tangled <laughs> up. Um. The more turns, the stronger the magnetism. I'm going to use 12 volts DC from a car battery. And, of course, you must never, ever use mains for something like this. The nail becomes magnetic when I complete the circuit, and when I break it again, most of the magnetism is lost. And if I wrap the wire around a little copper tube and hold it above the nail, then the magnetic attraction will uh, pull the nail off the table. Just getting slightly warm. This is an industrial electromagnet. The coil of wires in here, and this is the lump of metal it uh, pulls in. This one's actually um, out of a fruit machine. It's the device that pushes the coins out when you win. Well, I use these devices a lot on the machines that I make. I made this for a local solicitor. It's a portrait of the founder of the firm, his great uncle. And he wanted to be able to control it so it would react to his client's sometimes dubious confidences. In the end, he got cold feet and uh, placed the control box so that the clients themselves could use it. Well, if you look at the back, <coughs> you can see that the device that makes the wig go up in the air is one of these electric ma electromagnets. And by themselves, these electromagnets can only produce this rather jerky linear action. But it's actually not too difficult to use the electromagnetic attraction to make something rotate. To show the principles of a simple electric motor, I've made a motor out of virtual rubbish. Nails, hacksaw blade, an old needle, a cork, and a dog food can. The commutator is the part in the vacuum cleaner motor I've made from a cork with wires running up there. It acts as a sort of rotating switch. Each wire is attached to a coil. When the wires are in contact with the brass strips, current passes through. So at any time, only one pair of coils are energised. These pair of coils here are magnetised by the electric current and they're attracted to this pair of coils. Now, when it pulls to, to there, these coils switch off and it brings on the next pair of coils which are attracted to there. Of course, they switch off, bringing in the next pair, causing a rotating motion. I'll switch on. The vacuum cleaner motor doesn't at first sight look like Rex's tin can motor, but if you look inside, you can see it has a lot of the same elements. This is the commutator, the rotating contacts. These are the coils of wire rotating around the shaft, and these are the coils of wire around the outside, making them both magnetic. Well, in fact, there are many different types of electric motor, but they all depend on the basic ability of electricity to produce magnetism. It had been discovered in 1820 that any wire carrying electricity becomes slightly magnetic. The effect was called electromagnetism. Wrapping round the wire round in a coil greatly increases the effect. The extraordinary thing is that until 25 years ago, most of the telephone system was worked by devices based on this simple effect. This is a modern transistor. A small amount of current in one side switches a much larger amount on the other side. Here I've hooked up the high power side of a transistor to a car battery and a headlight. And uh, if I'm moistening my fingers, I can now switch the transistor with the tiny amount of current passing through my body just touching the low power side of the transistor is enough to switch the light on and off. 
solid state switching like this has enormous advantages. There are no mechanical parts to wear out, and of course there are no contacts to spark across. One thing that makes electronics less intimidating to me is that all the circuits are made up of a relatively small number of different types of component. I can show you quite a lot of these just with a light bulb and a battery. A resistor just acts as a restriction and makes the light dimmer. So twice the resistance makes it dimmer still. A diode lets the electricity flow one way but not the other. A capacitor stores electricity, only letting the current flow until it is fully charged. It can then release its stored electricity again when connected straight to the bulb. A transistor often acts as a sort of switch. The tiny amount of electricity from a battery made of a potato can switch the main battery and power the headlight. In fact, over 90% of the components on this board are like the ones I've just shown you. The integrated circuits are just really just a lot of components all sandwiched together, mostly transistors. I do admit that when you start joining everything together, the circuits very quickly become very complicated. The other thing that helps to reduce my intimidation about electronics is that you often don't need precise knowledge of a circuit to mend a fault. When a repairman repairs your telly, some of the faults are blatantly obvious as soon as he takes the back off. Components are either burnt out or been smoking, and you can actually smell the pungent smell from some of the components actually burning. Other faults are fairly obvious, like um, dry joints on the solder. That's when the solder hasn't flowed properly onto the component on the circuit boards. Although the circuit looks really complicated, it can be rather likened to a road map of the British Isles. And uh, if you were traveling between London and Brighton, for instance, you're not really worried about what the roads are doing around Glasgow and Edinburgh. And the same really applies to a TV set. Like reading a map, you can soon find the area you're interested in without detailed knowledge of the circuit boards. You can then narrow the fault down to a few suspect components. <laughs>